Thank you very much. So, um, so as my title indicates, I want to talk about some approaches to studying quantum dynamics in the semi-classical limit. So uh, for me, this is going to mean a small h-bar in the usual quantum mechanics and trying to get approximate solutions in that case. So uh, this is a sort of quick outline of what I plan to do. And uh, as I go down this list, there will be less and less detail. There will be very little detail on topics three and four. Uh, I'll try to actually indicate some proofs of things in uh, this first section and a little bit in uh, the second section. So the emphasis will be on these two things, mostly because these are the things I know uh, better than the other things. So uh, I'm always going to be doing the linear time-dependent Schrodinger equation. Uh, Einur and Tom are interested in uh, nonlinear things, which I view as much more complicated. But I want to study this uh, solutions to this equation where h is minus h bar squared over 2m Laplacian plus v. I'll usually take m to be 1 uh, for convenience. And my main motivation for these things is comes from chemistry, where uh, the psi is going to describe the uh, quantum mechanical state of the nuclei in some molecules. And the effective h-bar in that case is on the order of 1 over 100, if you use the appropriate units. Uh, so the h-bar is small. And in uh, chemical problems, the dimension d is typically 3 times the number of nuclei you've got. Now, you could remove some by taking out the center of mass and perhaps the rotations and things like that. But usually, you end up going to fairly high dimension. And that's one of the problems with uh, quantum chemistry. So uh, I want to introduce these things I call semi-classical wave packets. And uh, the notation will seem bizarre if you've never seen this before. But the notation is crucial to uh, proving certain things. So uh, I'm going to start with a position and a momentum, which are you want to think of as classical variables. And h bar is going to be a parameter I pretend I can play with, and it's going to be positive and small. And I'm also going to have uh, some complex d by d matrices. Uh, and you'll see the role they play in a little while. I'm going to call them capital A and capital B. And they will always satisfy these two strange conditions. Uh, so T stands for transpose. So A transpose B minus B transpose A is 0. And star stands for adjoint. So A adjoint B plus B adjoint A is twice the identity. And there's going to be some dynamics on the capital A and capital B. And the dynamics will preserve these conditions. So once you've imposed them with the initial conditions, they'll be there forever. And uh, first, I want to define some wave functions, which I'm going to call phi sub 0 with all these parameters in here. <laughs> and the space variable, the usual one you're doing the quantum mechanics in, is x. So uh, there's some normalization constants, uh, this determinant of a to the minus a half, and then uh, a quadratic in x in the exponent. So this is a complex Gaussian. And in fact, you can write any complex Gaussian this way with a, an appropriate choice of the capital A and capital B and little a and little eta. So this is uh, any normalized. So this is L2 norm 1. L2 norm is 1 on this. And uh, well, that's going to be one of my comments on the next slide. But that's where this funny condition first came from, is to make the L2 norm equal to 1. So that's a strange condition. Uh, it's a very weird condition. But I will always impose it. And it's, in particular, going to force this thing to have L2 norm 1. OK, so uh, well, the, the determinant, well, this has the covariance is BA inverse. And this has a determinant of A to the minus a half. So this, this condition is a little bit strange. And you'll see some more on the next slide, I think. So uh, let's see, the first of those two strange conditions I applied to uh, A and B force B A inverse to be symmetric in the sense of real symmetric plus I times something real symmetric. 
And the second condition is equivalent to this one. And that's related to Tom's comment that you're going to be taking a square root of a determinant uh, when you're doing the Gaussian integral to get the normalization right. And this is the right way to think about things uh, if you're doing it that way. Because in the, when you take the absolute square of the wave function, you get the real part of BA inverse showing up. And then the inverse of that is AA star, and that's where the determinant came from before. So that's the normalization uh, condition. And let's see, if you're going to go from position space to momentum space, you want to use a scaled Fourier transform with an h-bar. So this uh, is the transform which takes a position space wave function into a momentum space wave function. So xi is the momentum variable here. And if you just do a little calculation, you can do this explicitly. If you take the Fourier transform of a phi zero, you just get a phase times another phi zero. And the capital A and capital B have been switched. And the A and the eta have been switched. And there's a minus sign having to do with some symplectic geometry lurking in the background. Uh, so basically, if you Fourier transform a phi zero, you get another phi zero up to a trivial phase. OK, so uh, pictures are probably a better indicator of everything than, uh, than formulas. So this is a plot of position space. And I've plotted the absolute square of a phi zero here. Its center is around little a. And its width looks like the square root of h bar times the absolute value of a. And similarly, if you go over to momentum space, if you just use that formula I had on the previous slide about Fourier transforms, it's centered around eta. And the width is the square root of h bar times the absolute value of b. So that's the way you want to think of these things. They're highly localized near position a and near momentum eta as h bar goes to 0. And let's see, this is the plot of a real part of a phi 0. And I put this up mostly to comment that the momentum can change as you go across the wave packet. So you notice this thing is wiggling much more rapidly over here on the left than it is on the right. So the momentum isn't constant, but its average is eta. Okay, and there's again a Gaussian envelope to this thing. And let's see, this is a plot, I hope you can see it, of a two-dimensional, the real part of a two-dimensional phi zero. And I put this up mostly to scare everybody that the momentum can change direction as well as uh, amplitude. Here the amplitude's staying about the same, but the direction is changing as you go through this thing. So these are not trivial functions. Uh, there's a lot of structure here, more than you might imagine. Uh, and these are the basic objects I want to study for a little while here. Okay, and um, well, you can generalize these to get uh, some more states. And I think the cleanest way to do that is to use these raising and lowering operators. So uh, if you're in d dimensions, there are d raising operators. And this is the explicit formula <laughs> for the raising operators. It's a bit of a mess. And it contains kind of funny things. Uh, there's a, well, this is the adjoint of B showing up here and the adjoint of A showing up in there. Um, but anyway, if you uh, just take the formal adjoints of these, you get the lowering operators. And all of the different lowering operators commute. All of the raising operators commute. And if you try commuting a uh, lowering operator with a raising operator, you get a Kronecker delta. So uh, they don't commute in general. Oh, no, but, uh, oh, I see, yes, yeah. Right. The, A, the A does not commute with the A. Sorry, this is the right. usual, usual canonical. Yeah, it's the usual thing. The usual it's exactly the algebra of the structure you get from the harmonic oscillator. Yeah. It's identical. Yes. So, uh, so everything goes through the same as it does for the harmonic oscillator. OK? So. Uh, and then for, uh, again, I've written this in d dimensions. I probably should have done one. But if you, if you let j be a multi-index, you can define phi sub j by applying the various raising operators j times uh, to the phi 0 and then putting in a normalization factor. And if you do that, fix the capital A, the capital B, the h bar, the a, and the eta, you get an orthonormal basis of L2. So uh, this is a very nice set of functions in the sense that it's an orthonormal basis. 
And again, there's a Fourier transform formula. And from the raising and lowering operators, this is basically trivial to prove. That if you Fourier transform a phi j, you just get some phases times another phi j, but again, the a's and b's have been reversed, and the a's and a's have been reversed, and there's a minus sign. Okay, which is another very nice property of these things. And let's see, I put this picture up. Uh, this has a phi 0 in one dimension and a phi sub 12 <laughs> in one dimension. And uh, the main point of this is that the phi sub 12 is much more spread out than the phi 0. As you increase the uh, order of the multi-index, you get wave functions which are more and more spread out. And that will play a role in uh, some things I'm going to do a little bit later on. And does that mean that it has 12 bumps or not? Uh, it probably has 13 bumps, because the phi 0 has one bump. <laughs> 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 13 bumps, yeah, for the absolute square. <laughs> right. And uh, again, these are related to Hermit polynomials times Gaussians in one dimension, at least. So this is equivalent to that, the usual harmonic oscillator thing. Okay, let's see. So the first theorem, and in some sense this dates back to 1980 for the phi zeros. Uh, suppose you have a potential which has uh, three continuous derivatives. It's bounded below and doesn't grow extremely fast. And suppose you let the uh, a of t, a of t, and so on solve this system of ordinary differential equations. And suppose capital Psi is an exact solution to the time-dependent Schrodinger equation with the initial condition of some phase times a phi j. Then uh, there's an approximate solution for any time, um, which is a phi j with the propagated parameters put in there. And the uh, error is h bar to the half in magnitude. So the difference between the, uh, or the norm of the difference between the approximate solution and the exact solution is bounded by a constant times h bar to the half. And that's global in time. For scattering states, that's global in time. Uh, if you're not in a scattering situation, then I want to keep the time fixed, or I can go up to the Ehrenfest time. Um, if you know what that is. Uh, it's essentially log h bar times some constant. And it's a particular constant. Uh, you can't do it at any constant times log h bar. Uh, so that's uh, the first theorem. Oh, and let's see. The first two equations in this system are Hamilton's equations, which is equivalent to f equals ma, where the force is minus the gradient of the potential. So the the derivative of the uh, position is the velocity, which, since I've got the mass equal to 1, is the momentum. And the derivative of the momentum is the force. The s of t is just the classical action integral associated with the path you're interested in here. So when you integrate this, you get the classical action. And the capital A and capital B satisfy a fairly strange system. But I'll comment on the next slide particularly that they're related to classical mechanics. So everything in sight here is determined by classical mechanics. So your V2 is, uh, I guess, is the, is the Hessian. Hessian. It's the second derivative. Yeah, so the Hessian matrix. And this is matrix multiplication here. So that's a non-trivial system, too. So it's a, yeah, it's a non-trivial so system. It's a, it's a linear, no. It's linear. It's linear. Yeah, it's linear. In fact, that's part of why I uh, want to insist on this notation being a good thing. You get a linear system out of this for the A's and B's. If you look, the A's are not, not, not the little A's, but the capital A and capital B, you get a linear system. If you look in the squeezed state literature, you'll find the phi zeros, and, well, in some sense, these are complex versions of the usual squeezed states. And, uh, Oh, th there's, there's a lot of physics literature. If you Google I know, squeeze, I have no idea what oh, they're essentially Gaussians, but you haven't chosen the covariance matrices uh, to be one, <laughs> you know, to be the identity. So th they could have a, a small delta x, but then a large delta p. Okay. Okay. So they're, they're those yeah, things. They're, they're coherent states? Or? Yeah, they're still coherent states. Okay. Right. And the usual notation that's used in the squeeze state literature does not have the BO, BA inverse business in it. And uh, as a result, they get some nonlinear equations for the covariance. But if they write it the way you do, they have 
if they would write it the way I do, they would get linear equations and it would be much easier to prove lots of estimates. So I claim this is a much better notation than in all the squeeze state literature. And it's the same set of states. You know, if, you complex, if you allow yourself to have complex it's Gaussians, parameterized it's parameterized differently. That's right. Okay, so uh, that's the uh, first theorem here. Oh, and let's see, I promised this the capital A and capital B would have something to do with classical mechanics. So suppose you study the flow which takes a point A of 0 and eta of 0 to a point A of t and eta of t. That's a nice flow on phase space. And you can take the derivative of the final position of momentum with respect to the initial position of momentum. And those are these partial derivatives I've got here. And they're commonly called uh, classical Jacobi fields. And the capital A and capital B uh, can be computed directly from the classical Jacobi fields. So is this the first variation? In, uh, that, those, are mat those are matrices. The, everything in sight here is a matrix, right. And uh, yeah, it's just the first variation around the classical path. Yeah. Right, exactly. So that's, the Jacobi field, I guess. that's the Jacobi field, right. And let's see, I thought I would try to outline how you prove this. Uh, and well, as I th have commented uh, earlier today, there's more than one proof out there. So this is the proof that does not use the Trotter product formula. <laughs> uh, so suppose you have a candidate for a solution, an approximate solution to the Schrodinger equation. And you stick it in to the Schrodinger equation. It's not going to solve it exactly. So I'm going to use that to define this function zeta. So zeta is the residual after you've substituted your candidate into the Schrodinger equation. And suppose you have a good bound on zeta you know its norm is bounded by this some quantity mu. Then the difference between the exactly propagated state and the approximate guy, uh, that norm is bounded by h bar inverse times the integral of this mu. And this is a relatively easy uh, lemma to prove. Uh, you just use the unitarity of uh, e to the minus ith to move it to the other term. Then you just write everything as the integral of its derivative, put the norms inside the integrals, and you're done. <laughs> so the job is to get a good bound on the mu. And incidentally, you lose the h bar here because it's i h bar d by dt. So it might be more natural to write it as i d by dt and then divide the other side by h bar. But that's why you lose the h bar. Okay, so uh, anyway, that's the, uh, the main lemma for proving this the way I want to think about it today. So uh, I'll let my candidate be the phase times the phi j. I'll substitute it into the Schrodinger equation and compute this zeta. And if you do that, this is an exact formula for what you get. It's the, uh, you get the difference between v and its second order Taylor series based around the point A of t. So this, that's what I've written out here. And then if you use the standard estimates we teach in calculus class, the error is cubic in x minus a. And when you compute the norm of zeta, you've got a cubic times this Gaussian, and you just do a rescaling, you see it's h bar to the 3 halves. And then you lose an h bar, so the error if you propagate over some finite time, looks like h bar to the 1 half. Right. This is the, this is the error I've been writing. This, this is the zeta from right. the previous lemma. Go back to the previous slide. Well, OK. So the zeta is this residual thing. Oh, it is the residual. It's the residual. And then the, the norm of the zeta is this mu. And then you lose an h bar yeah, after yeah, you've integrated it. Yeah, you get hold of the zeta and bound it with a good bound, and then that gives you the bound you really want for the error you've made in propagation. Right. Right. So that's the whole story on this Wait, proof. I went too fast. Oh, I went too fast for you. OK. <laughs> oh, this is the zeta. We have it explicitly. And it gives you something which is cubic in x minus a to leading order times um, one of these phi j's. And the phi j's are scaled. But this is an exact, this is an identity. This, this is an identity, yes. And uh, to leading order, it's cubic in x minus a. And this has been, everything in here has been scaled 
in terms of x minus a over the square root of h bar. So when you rescale the integral, the cubic guy out front gets an h bar to the 3 halves. And that's where this comes from. And then you lose an h bar because of the lemma, and you end up with an h bar to the half. So that's the whole story from this viewpoint on proving theorem 1. Oh, because this is, the error is cubic. The difference between a s function and its second order Taylor series is cubic. And then it's just a question of the scaling in the integral when you compute the norm. So it's really the scaling that's doing it. So it's, it's one slide proof. Yeah, <laughs> basically that's right. <laughs> right. So uh, and that's the idea for this proof of theorem 1. Uh, let's see, then... Uh, you know, we couldn't leave this alone. Uh, we made it complicated. <laughs> so this is the next more complicated result. I want to start uh, with an initial condition that's a phase times a linear combination of finitely many of these phi j's. We could do better than finitely many, but let me leave it at this for the moment. Then uh, if you give me any L, and if V is Cl plus 2, I can construct an approximate uh, solution which has the same phase factor. The capital A and capital B and so on are all the same as before. But the coefficients will change in time. And you have to take more wave packets down here after you've propagated. But this is the number you have to take. <laughs> or it's a bound on the number you have to take. And then uh, if you do this the, correctly, the approximate solution minus the exact solution will look like some constant times h bar to the L over 2. So how is this different from what you had before? Oh, th what I had before was just the case where L equals 1. I understand. But then this is just, why can't I just say, well, this just follows from superposition? Well, it, it is just superposition, but I have a specific set of C's in mind, and I also tell you how many you have to take in order to get the error small. This, and the C's are going to change in time. In the earlier result, they didn't change. But is there an interaction between the five different phi J's, or there isn't really, is there? Or it's really, there is. Well, there's the superposition principle going on. But if you started with a phi zero, you're going to get all these other guys at later times oh, to this order. So the, the phi's are going to produce other phi's. Oh, okay. Now you're getting a higher Yes, I'm getting higher accuracy. The first one was h bar to the 1 half, and now it's h bar to the l over 2. Right. So you can go to any order in the square root of h bar over 2. The uh, trouble with this, uh, which will come up in the, the next slide, is this c can grow pretty drastically with l. So uh, once again, well, this, this gets you up to about 1986 or something in the <laughs> progression of these theorems in my life. Um, Theorem 3 is much more recent. It was joint work with Alain Joie and uh, Grenoble. And uh, suppose V is actually analytic in a strip. If, if you're in one dimension, it's a strip around the real axis. Otherwise, it's a union of poly disks. And suppose in the strip, you have this bound on the V, and it's also bounded below. And uh, once again, we want to uh, take an exact solution to the Schrodinger equation with an initial condition like what we had on the previous theorem. And then there exists an approximate solution which uh, looks just like what I had on the previous slide, except that the number of terms I take here is going to depend on h bar. And so are these depending on h bar. And if I do it right, I can arrange for the approximate solution minus the exact solution to be exponentially small in h bar. And I'd commented uh, that as you increase the multi-index, these wave packets get more and more spread out. But if you choose everything correctly, you can prove that the probability that you're more than a distance delta away from the classical path is exponentially small also. So uh, up to exponential accuracy, Sir Isaac Newton was right <laughs> if you take a small h-bar. 
Well, I, uh, he did classical mechanics, right? <laughs> uh, so classical mechanics tells you what happens here. Um, they, they solve a big system of ODEs, and as you shrink h-bar, the system gets bigger. So this, so this, this increases as you decrease h-bar. So, so it's a big system of ODEs if h-bar is small. Right. Yeah, so in fact, they have a yes, they're linear. It's a linear system. It's all linear systems. Um, so uh, yeah, we. Actually, and the raising and lowering operators play a big role in getting a good enough estimate to prove this. And the way this theorem is proved is to go back to the uh, previous theorem and get a careful estimate on this C. How does it grow with L? Um, and it grows basically like a power times a factorial. Uh, and that's, that's how we get this exponential estimate in here. So this is done by uh, the process called optimal truncation of the asymptotic series. Right, all these series are divergent, but you can get error bounds. Yeah, but you, but you're you can't get better than exponential. As far as I know, you can't get anything better than exponential. Um, and let's see, there are effects which we're not taking into account, like tunneling. Um, and so you shouldn't expect to do better than exponential. That should be the best you can do. Uh, Okay, so uh, let's see, a little comment here is uh, a couple years ago, Fau, Gradnaru, and Lubich uh, used this to generate a numerical scheme for solving the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. And they, uh, to the extent they could compare it to other things, it worked very well. So that's uh, assuming you have the right initial data. So this uh, they viewed as something quite successful. And in one dimension, we've used this to describe tunneling by taking enough wave packets uh, and non-adiabatic transitions in the Born-Oppenheimer approximation by taking enough wave packets. And uh, Fau, Gradnaru, and Lubick uh, actually applied this to some problem in 12 dimensions, but they didn't have anything to compare with. <laughs> so they don't really know whether it did a good job numerically or not because they, there isn't any alternative. Um, so, uh, and let's see, also very recently, uh, Vasile Gradnaru uh, and I have been working together, and we realized there was a way you could really improve the accuracy of their algorithm at essentially zero cost. Uh, the sort of cost when I ran this, uh, I was doing something in one dimension, the extra cost was about a tenth of a second in a run that took on the order of 10 minutes. So the, the increase in cost is completely negligible, but you really speed up, the, you get a much more accurate result for small h-bars. And the, uh, if you play the game this way, the errors get better as you shrink h-bar. For most schemes, they get worse as you shrink h-bar. So uh, we haven't gotten that written up yet, but uh, I, I'm hoping to see Vasile in a month or two, and we hope to get this finished up. Let's see, the, so the second part of the talk I want to give here today involves a completely different approach to semi-classical problems. The uh, wave packets I've described so far are all highly localized in position and in momentum. But uh, lots of times people want to look at initial conditions which have that sort of form. There's some rapidly oscillating phase times some amplitude. So I'm calling the amplitude F and the phase <coughs> term S here. And it's not localized at all <laughs> in position or momentum, the way I've done this. And uh, there's almost some philosophy going on here. The way you want to think about this is if you have the function e to the i k x over h bar, it's got momentum k. And you get the k by taking the gradient up here. So near position x, the intuition is that this wave packet is going to have momentum, the gradient of s at x. So it's going to change as you vary x, uh, but the momentum near, th when near the point x is supposed to be the gradient of s. And uh, one then views this state in phase space as living near this manifold, which I've called L, which is the set of positions and momenta which are given by x and the gradient of s at x. 
So rather than thinking about working in position space, we're going to be trying to work in momentum space. And this state is going to be localized near this submanifold, uh, which is the pairs at x and the gradient of s of x. And you only care about those when x is in the support of f, because that's the only place this wave function is non-zero. OK, so uh, this is the sort of picture of phase space I have here. I initially have a function defined down here on the x-axis. I compute this uh, new manifold that I called L, and I tried to indicate that in blue here. And it's the pairs x and gradient s at x. The momentum is vertical, is the vertical axis, and the horizontal axis is position. And I think about, instead of having the f lie on the real axis, I'm going to think about it living on here, where I've parameterized this manifold by x. So the f lives up there, and everything lives on the manifold. OK, and now I'm going to propagate this. And actually, in my pictures, I always propagated by the harmonic oscillator, just because it was easy. <laughs> so. Uh, Anyway, so I propagate for a little bit of time, and that manifold looks like this. And I chose this as a time where uh, it's still parameterized by the position variable, because it projects, you know, it's a function of the position variable, how high the momentum is at each point. And again, I think about this, uh, the f is living on here, but it's been the, the, the new f is the old f moved forward by the transport of the classical mechanics. So the new f is the f at the old point you came from to get to x at time t. Okay, And then uh, this WKB approximation says that the approximate wave function back in x space ought to be e to the i s, where s is the new function which gives you the momentum. Uh, and you have to worry about the constant, because this just the momentum just comes from the gradient of that. So you have to get the constant right. And then you take the f that you came from to get to the point x at time t. This notation may be fairly bad. And then there's a Jacobian factor, or what I think of as a Jacobian factor, that keeps the L2 norm preserved. And that's this piece here. Okay, so uh, that's the approximation as you propagate in time, at least for short times. But uh, there can be a problem. And I should have taken this label off the graph because it isn't a function. <laughs> and this is the problem. This is the really big problem in this business. This does not arise uh, as a function of x uh, for, and the gradient of s of x. It's not a function, and for, well, it's maybe made out of three pieces that are functions, but then the derivatives get to be infinite. Uh, so this is very bad, <laughs> and bad things happen. And uh, my understanding is of what I'm going to describe is that Maslow is the source of the solution to this problem, the way I'm going to describe it here. Um, Maslow's work. Um, it's not clear what's rigorous and what's not in a lot of it, and, uh, but it's clearly got a brilliant idea uh, as far as I'm concerned in it. So what to do in this case? So uh, the first thing is to cut the manifold into pieces by a C infinity partition of unity. And do so in such a way that each of the pieces you're left with projects either into the x-axis or into the p-axis, if I'm in one dimension. And if you're in more dimensions, there are more possibilities. You could do some x's and some p's and things like that. Then you project into the corresponding axis the way I did before to get a wave function in whatever that variable is. And there's also some mysterious uh, phase factors of e to the i pi over 4 that show up. Uh, and you also have to keep in mind that there's a minus sign difference from the way things work in position space and momentum space because of the symplectic nature of things. And wherever you've projected into a momentum space, you should inverse Fourier transform to get back into position space, and then you add up all the contributions. And that's the, the Maslow solution to this problem when the manifold doesn't project into x space. And, 
Yeah, so you want to use a partition of unity to break this into pieces, each of which you can project into x or into p, and then for the parts you've projected into a p variable, you inverse Fourier transform to get back into x, and then you sum up the contributions. And the idea is this is supposed to give you an approximation to the true wave function and avoid all of these problems because you couldn't project in certain directions. And you can always project in some variables or some other variables. So this is to save you from this projection problem. That avoids having the determinant. Uh, that avoids having the determinant give you zero, so you get uh, something to the zero to the minus a half, right? And you avoid that completely by this method. Uh, so uh, the uh, example that I had before, this is the same graph except I put some lines on. This is about where you want to make the cuts, but again, you have to do it smoothly to make everything work. So I would use a partition of unity here that had three pieces, and I'd have the uh, little region around here where I did the cutting up here, and then I'd have a little region down there where I did the cutting there. And I would project the first and third pieces directly into X, and I would project this one into P, and then inverse Fourier transform. Okay, so that's the way I uh, would interpret this Maslow approach here. And let's see, one way to see that how this might work let me just do a little example to show you that something reasonable happens. So suppose I look at this wave function, which is e to the i x squared over 2 h bar times some f of x, where f is nice and smooth and so on. Then uh, the Lagrangian manifold associated with this is the set x equals p or p equals x. So you could project it either way. It shouldn't matter. So if you uh, project into x space, well, you get just this. <laughs> so you know what you're expecting to get. But if you project into p space and keep the right power of this phase and so on, and keep the minus sign because of things being different in momentum space, you get that when you do the projection. And now I'd like to do the inverse Fourier transform. So I've just written out the inverse Fourier transform here of that function. And then I've completed the square up here in the uh, integral. And now I just apply the method of stationary phase to evaluate that integral approximately. And what comes out is exactly what you were expecting up here, plus an order h-bar error. So uh, you can see that up to an order h-bar error, this uh, appears to work, at least in this example. And it strikes me as a completely reasonable thing to do. I think this is a really nice solution to the problem of these caustics where you can't do the projection into X space directly. So uh, I think that's a, that's, this idea is a very nice one for getting around these caustic problems. So where would I see the caustic in this problem? Oh, there aren't any in this one. Okay. But I, I just wanted to show that you, in this case you could project either way yeah. and it's giving you the same answer up to an order H bar error. So, uh, and that's, uh, you have to be able to tolerate some errors in this business. Uh, but again, they're small if h bar is small. Yeah. Right? So, uh, but, but intuitively, you could, you, could, you could get rid of those errors too, and you could go higher order. You could go higher order, you yes. You could go higher order. And I, uh, well, let's see, this would be the exact projection for this example. I don't know what this guy is. I haven't done the, the correction term. Uh, you would hope that it would be zero. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I might doubt that. Uh, <laughs> but I don't know. I haven't computed it in this case. Yeah, I think you're going to pick up some sort of derivatives of f times something. Uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised. All right, let's see. So uh, I do know a situation where there's a fairly straightforward proof of this. Uh, from a student of mine who graduated in 1986, so this was a long time ago, a fellow named Sam Robinson, and he had an el a relative elementary proof that uh, this whole WKB business would work if you were only looking at times when you could project the manifold into the x-axis. So he just ignored the problem about the caustics, these bad times when you can't project, but you know, it might be that there's a, you start off at a good time and then you go through some bad times and then you come back to some good times and so on. 
So at any good time, his technique will work. And Sam's idea was you start with this initial condition and you make a uh, small error on the order of h bar to the half by writing it as a superposition of phi zeros. So you're effectively convolving with a, an approximate Dirac delta-like thing. Uh, so that's why this is, you make a small error when you do this because these are highly concentrated uh, as a function of x minus a zero here. And now you'd like to propagate that. But when the propagator acts on this integral, it only acts on the phi zeros, the on the Gaussians. Right? It doesn't care about all the other stuff in that expression. So when you propagate, it will give you a new function s up here, which depends on lots of things. My notation is probably bad. And you pick up an a of t and a b of t and so on. Um, but that's what you get when you propagate the Gaussians inside the integral. And now uh, comes uh, what's probably the hard part. He changes variables from a0 as the integration variable to a as the integration variable, the a that's occurring in here, which depends on the a0. Um, and if you go through all of that carefully, you get the, this expression, which I had written earlier. Um, and the, the sort of funny phases show up because of the determinant of a to the minus a half, which is inside the phi zero. So that's the source of these Maslow index phases, uh, which seem rather mysterious in this whole game. Oh, if, if you haven't gone through any caustics, the, the, the phase is just one. You don't get anything. But this, this, this has to do with the, with the caustics, with, right. with the lack but, of projections. Well, it's, it has to, it, the, uh, the Maslow index sort of counts how many times you've gone through caustics. But I'm assuming you could have gone through some, but at the time you're actually doing this, you don't have any. Right. But uh, so you could have gone through some while propagating. And that's why this could be a non-trivial phase factor. Right. Okay, so that, that actually gives a rigorous proof that's not too nasty uh, for this WKB type approach uh, using the semi-classical mix. Yes, so you're writing the general data as a superposition of Gaussians, and you know how to propagate the Gaussians. So that's the idea. Right, the inverse transform is, is the most complicated part of all that. Okay, so let's see, I promised a couple of other things. Uh, first of all, Bargman transforms. Uh, actually, the, the last two topics all are from Princeton people along the way. I knew Bargman when I was a student uh, long ago. Uh, but anyway, in 1961, he wrote down this transform, which I've written here without the h-bars in it, which uh, turns out to be a unitary map from L2 of Rd dx into a space of functions in L2 of Cd with a funny measure. It's a Gaussian measure. Uh, and you have to integrate over the whole space. And when I say analytic, I really mean entire. So this gives you a unitary map from what you want to think of as L2 of position space into L2 of phase space. You want to think of the real part of these variables as the position and the imaginary part as the momentum. So this allows you to get yourself into phase space and then you avoid all these caustic problems. There's no, you're never going to project into X space so you've just avoided all of the issues associated with doing that. Um, the standard harmonic oscillator um, raising and lowering operators get to be multiplication by z and differentiation with respect to z. So they are also quite simple. Um, and um, well, you, I should have probably introduced the h-bar in here, but anyway, the, the main moral of the story is that you avoid all the caustic problems if you work all the time in phase space. You don't ever have to worry about that. Uh, and let's see, there's a recent uh, PhD thesis by a fellow named Brian Jennings. Uh, who had been at the University of Michigan. He finished his thesis just about exactly a year ago. 
Uh, and he had done semi-classical analysis using the Bargman representation of things. So he had done exactly this kind of thing. So the idea is what? Did you, did you try to write general data in this form? Or? Well, you, you can take any wave packet you like and move it into the Bargman space. Uh, he was actually looking at these ones which live on some Lagrangian manifold again. And then he was propagating them there. And he didn't have to worry about caustics because he wasn't ever projecting back into position space. He's in phase space all the time, globally. globally. Yeah, he starts. In, he chooses his data to start somewhere in phase space, and he chooses it to end in phase space, and doesn't worry about going back and forth. Although you could, in principle, do the inverse Bargman transform, uh, but that might be fairly nasty, I guess, if there are caustics. I don't know. I haven't haven't done one of those. All right. So then, let's see. The the other thing I wanted to mention briefly. Uh, Eugene Wigner was also here at Princeton. And uh, in a paper in 1932, he wrote down this function, which I'm calling W of x and p. This is usually called the Wigner function nowadays. And uh, it's given by this fairly simple looking integral, but it's quadratic in the psi. It's got a psi conjugate and a psi in it. So you lose the phase information, the total phase, because it's got this product. Uh, and the, well, the phase is just plain gone. And people usually think of this as being like a probability distribution in phase space. But it's not a probability distribution because it could be negative. <laughs> so, uh, but that's usually the way people think about it. Um, that, you know, it can only be, well, it's more or less large only where you should expect to find the particle. And there are a couple of uh, nice features. You can compute the absolute square of psi by integrating out the momentum variable. And you can compute the uh, absolute square of psi hat, the momentum space wave function squared, by integrating out the position variables. So in, you still do have a way of getting your hands on the uh, probability densities in position and momentum from the Wigner function. Uh, but again, you've lost the overall phase, so if you have some problem where you're going to get interferences going on, uh, that might be bad. Um, and the advantage, again, is that you're working in phase space, so you don't have to worry about caustics and things like that if you're working with this W function instead of psi. Um, but the uh, equations of motion are much more complicated. Um, there's something which looks like the sort of Heisenberg equations uh, of, for propagating this W, but they involve these Moyal brackets, which are more complicated than the usual things you deal with with commutators and such. So uh, with these last two things, there, there are these advantages. You don't have to worry about caustics, but you pay some price. You know, there's some kind of conservation of difficulty in the world. Um, so you, you uh, have some complicated objects to work with as a result of getting rid of some other difficulty. So there's a semi-classical dynamics of this too then? Or right. There's, yeah, the, the, the sort of leading behavior of the solution to the dynamics for the W uh, is essentially classical mechanics. So, uh, but, it's, but it's again a complicated story to really write everything out. Yeah, that's right. So it's, so it's looking like the classical mechanics in some strong sense, <laughs> right, as you'd let h bar go to zero. Yeah. So that's everything I'd planned to say today, except to thank you for your time and attention, and to also thank the NSF that supported me along the way. So thank you. Thanks.